Hi, I'm Tony Northup, and this is my free tutorial for the Nikon D850. This is a long tutorial, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. Look at the description down below, and you'll see a table of contents that allows you to jump to the parts that you want to see. I'm going to assume you're an experienced photographer who's worked with other cameras, so I'm going to skip the basics and try to keep it a little tighter. If you have a friend with a camera and they want a tutorial, visit sdp.io slash tutorials, and there you can see an index of all of our tutorials. First up, the battery. The battery is backwards compatible with the uh, D810, so you can use these back and forth. You can use your old D810 batteries, no problem. It is, however, a new battery hit under here, the uh, ENEL 15A. It's the gray battery is a little bit different. Um, I found that the battery life on this camera is excellent unless you are recording a lot of video or you decide that you want to use the SnapBridge wireless. If you even connect to your phone, the battery can disappear really quickly. So I do recommend picking up, picking up an extra battery, and I recommend buying the original Nikon battery just because we've tested just about all the off-brands. We go through a lot of batteries, and they work great for mm, six weeks, sometimes six months, and that's enough for them to get good reviews on Amazon or whatnot, but then they will suddenly die and leave you stranded. So. As a rule, we only buy name brand batteries for any of the camera manufacturers. Throughout this video, you'll see links to sdp.io links. These go to uh, our Amazon affiliate. So if you buy stuff from them, we get a few pennies out of it. Just full disclosure, it helps us out. Let's talk about the memory card configuration. The D850 has an unusual memory card configuration. It has an XQD card, which is a new, fairly new format that Sony kind of pioneered. It's known for being really, really fast. So you're going to use the XQD card whenever possible, especially if you're shooting sports or action or you're just taking thousands of shots. Putting them on the XQD card will make it all go faster and reduce your buffering. XQD cards are expensive though, and you can't even really buy them in really large capacities. The other slot here is an SD card. It supports UHS-2. This is not a UHS-2 card. The UHS-2 cards have two little rows of teeth like this. If you're mostly concerned about quality, maybe you're shooting an event or a wedding and you're not banging off you know, 40 shots consecutively, you're not worried about buffering, shoot raw to both cards. Get cards of equal sizes, shoot raw to both of them. If one of the cards fail, you'll have a full raw backup. If you're shooting for speed, shoot raw to the XQD card and shoot JPEG to the SD card. The SD card is slower than the XQD card, so the XQD card is like a, a really big pipe and the SD card is a much smaller pipe but if you're trying to fit the same amount of data through both those pipes, the SD card becomes your bottleneck, and that means that the camera's gonna start to buffer if you're shooting a lot of consecutive cards, and that means you're gonna start missing shots. So if you're willing to accept a JPEG file as a backup in the unlikely event that your XQD card fails, then you can make everything go much faster. To set this memory card configuration, you'll access the menu system up here by pressing the menu button. Then you'll go up to the camera icon up here. Notice I'm liking to use the touchscreen interface. I know it takes a little getting used to. Uh, check your primary slot selection here. It's XQD card by default, and that's pretty much what you always want to be using. And then your secondary slot selection, you can see that your options are for overflow, which means it only makes one copy of each file, starting with the XQD card, and once the XQD card is full, it will continue writing to the SD, SD card. Backup will write raw files to both cards, or JPEG files, whatever you've selected. And the third option here is the one I'm suggesting for sports, but with a backup, and that's raw primary, JPEG secondary. So there, assuming you're writing raw files, you can see now it's set to JPEG. I'll set that to raw. Assuming you're writing, writing raw files, the raw file will go to the XUD card, and the JPEG will go to the SD card, letting it write quickly. You can use this link to buy an XQD card, and let me just say, this is a 45 megapixel camera, and those RAW files are huge, and if you record 4K video, it's huge. Your cards are not as big as you think they are. 64 gig cards aren't going to cut it. That's going to lead to frustration. For a camera like this, we would typically use 256 or 512 gig cards. I can't get those now in the XQD form. Maybe you, future person, can get them, but right now I can only get up to 128 gigs, so that's what I'm using. But it means I have to get a few of those and keep some extra ones. So keep some extra ones or just get as big as you can. But this camera eats memory cards. <laughs> for the SD card, remember for best performance, you wanna get a high performance UHS-2 card. Again, if you're writing to both cards, this is going to become the bottleneck, so the performance of this SD card might actually be more important. 
UHS-2 is an update to the original UHS standard that allows for higher read and write speeds. I also want to suggest getting a memory card reader for your tablet or smartphone, whether iOS or Android, because this camera has SnapRidge wireless built in, but I find it to be kind of a pain. So uh, I have a much better workflow when I, I'm, I'm an Apple person at the moment, when I disconnect this SD card reader either into my phone or my iPad and unload the images that way, Lightroom Mobile can handle the RAW files. So this is what I'm using, but when I was using Android, I was using one of these. You'd probably be happier with that than <laughs> trying to use SnapBridge. If you don't have Lightroom and Lightroom Mobile, it's a cool way to synchronize your files from your tablet or smartphone back to your desktop and allow for full editing if you do that workflow. Uh, you can pick it up at sdp.io slash Adobe Deal. Let's talk about the ports on the camera. They're mostly pretty self-explanatory, but there are some extra ports. Over on the left side of the camera here at the top, you see your video ports. They kind of peel off in two parts, which is nice. This first one is the microphone, in case you're recording to an external microphone like I'm using here. And the other one is the headphones. So good, you can pipe in an external mic and actually listen to it so it's a capable video machine. The one below here is the USB port. Notice that it's USB 3 for nice high bandwidth transfers. That's perfect if you're doing some tethering. Trust me, you wouldn't want to be tethering with USB 2. You could connect a USB 2 cable into the larger part of this, but you always want to be using a USB 3 cable into a USB 3 port on a computer if you're doing tethering. Right below this, you have the HDMI. This is a mini HDMI port. Um, you would use this either for an external field monitor if you're recording video or to hook it up to a TV just to do a slideshow or something, but people don't often use these. Just remember you'd need a mini HDMI to full HDMI cable in order to connect it. There's a couple other ports on the front here. Peel this little thing back and you have an old PC sync cable. Woo! You should just always just keep this sealed up. <laughs> they, for old times sake, they keep including a PC sync port, but they are the worst. I used to have a studio set up that used PC sync and it would just, the cable would just randomly fall out. They've never fastened on well. The one below this is for a remote control. You probably won't ever need that because this camera has shutter delays and intervalometers built into it. And that's the biggest reasons you'd probably use a remote control. But maybe you just want a remote trigger so that you can fire it off faster when you're shooting macro or something. And you don't have to shake the camera. I want to mention the control lock. Now, of course, you have this directional pad here, which you can use to move around the picture or navigate menus and whatnot. There's this lock here and it does not take much pressure to flip at all. And I don't know, once a month or so with our D810s or the D850s, we'll be shooting and we'll be like, man, why is this control broken? Just flip it back. So I just wanted to show that to you. If you think your camera's broken, check that control lock, it's a pain. This camera is the first in this series of camera to have the lights built in. So just like other cameras, there's this light switch right on the power switch here. So the camera's off, the camera's on and now the camera's lit. And you can see the LCD here lights up like those old Indiglo watches. It's a little bright in here, but the buttons on the left side of the camera will also light up. You will appreciate this so much the first time you do night photography. So take a minute now, grab your camera and do that a few times just to train yourself to use that light. So when you're out getting astrophotography and you're looking for the zoom in button or the rating button down here, you'll remember. And throughout this video, I'm going to be demonstrating things on the camera. I suggest you follow along because photographers learn more with their hands than with their eyes. You need to actually be doing all this with your camera as I do it. First, let's actually take a picture. There's two different ways you can take a picture with live view back here or with the viewfinder. If uh, you're under 30, you're probably going to want to use live view because you grew up taking pictures with your smartphone. And if you're over 30, you'll probably be more comfortable with the viewfinder. I like the viewfinder because it blocks out any distractions and also focusing is much, much faster when I'm using the viewfinder. So as long as you don't see anything on the back screen here and the camera's on, you'll be able to use the viewfinder. You can just look through it, push the shutter button down halfway and the camera will focus and then push the shutter all the way to take a picture. When you're looking through the viewfinder, you'll see lots of little red boxes that will, those are the focusing points. It will hunt the entire scene and if it catches something in the focus point you have selected, it'll lock in and stop trying to focus in the default settings. As you're looking through the viewfinder, you can adjust the diopter to kind of dial in a glasses prescription. So if your vision is less than perfect, most people's vision isn't perfect, or if you're a glasses wearer and you want to take your glasses off to look through the viewfinder, you'll use this diopter. It's important to know about the diopter because sometimes it gets hit accidentally. And so you think your camera isn't focusing 
and it's just because the diopter is blurring everything out. So this one has a lock on it, which is nice. You'll pull it out, and then you'll turn it. Now, you need to be doing this when you have the camera up to your eye. So pull it out first, hold the camera up to your eye, push the shutter button halfway, and look at the numbers on the bottom. Don't look through the lens, but look at the numbers at the bottom, and turn that diopter until everything is as sharp as possible. And then when you're done, lock it back in place. You can easily set a crop on this camera, and that can be really useful because 45 megapixel files are big. So if you can't zoom far enough, if you can't get close enough, something like sports or wildlife, set a crop in the camera and you'll save yourself some processing time. Now, you can do this. You can look, hold the camera up and then you're gonna hold this button. It's labeled FN1 right by the lens here. You can kind of hit it with your finger. So you'll hit it like that and then you'll move this back dial here to adjust the crop. Now, as I'm looking through the viewfinder and I'm moving that crop, I'm gonna see boxes drawn in the viewfinder showing different crops. And as I just keep scrolling that, I scroll through all the different viewfinder options. When you're done with that, be sure to reset it back to full frame just so the next time you pick up the camera, you're not gonna be confused and cropping without being aware of it. You'll end up with some really weird pictures. By default, the viewfinder just draws a straight box, but you can mask that off, and I prefer it to be masked because it makes it a little easier for me to tell where it's being cropped, and also I won't forget. To set that mask, hit the menu button, go to the camera menu here, and on the first page, you'll see image area at the bottom. So select that, and then you can see this bottom option here, viewfinder mask display. So I'll touch that and select on. And now when I look through the viewfinder, I'll see that mask in place when I have the mask turned on. Get to know this sort of in-camera crop, especially for wildlife and sports and any sort of distance stuff, because it can save you a lot of disk space, save you a lot of buffering too, because the buffering takes a lot less time because it's writing smaller files. Another way to reduce your storage requirements is to change the size of the raw file. Instead of shooting 45 megapixel files, you can drop it down to 25 megapixels or 11 megapixels by using the large, medium, and small raw image options. To change the raw file size, hit the menu button, and then on the camera icon, go down to the second page and select image size. So I'll select image size, and then at the bottom you can see NEF raw. By default, it's set to large. You can scroll down to medium or small. Small is really little, but that's still enough to make a reasonable eight by 10 or put stuff on Instagram. So for pictures that are you don't care that much about, you don't plan to use for anything serious, they're just going on Instagram, that's fine. Medium, higher quality images, but maybe you don't wanna deal with a full 45 megapixel file. And then for the ultimate image quality, your most important pictures, stuff you might blow up large, shoot in the raw large format. Those lower quality, lower megapixel files actually take extra processing time because the camera always shoots at 45 megapixels and then it will have to scale it down when it, while it's in the buffer. So if you select a smaller size, you might actually see increased buffering, just something to be aware of. This camera is very difficult to get sharp images out of full 45 megapixels because it, it's just technically very hard. When you shoot with a camera like this, if you haven't shot with a high megapixel camera, you will discover that your technique is not as good as you thought it was. If you thought you could handhold 200 millimeters at 60th of a second, maybe with a stabilized lens, those pictures will have visible camera shake on this camera because the lower resolution sensor, maybe the uh, anti-aliasing filter on something like a Canon camera, would have been hiding your movement. Now, you're always going to be getting more detail out of the higher meg megapixel camera, but it will be obvious that any blurriness is a result of poor technique. So I suggest a combination of technologies and techniques. First, I pretty much only use VR lenses with this camera. I have a lot of experience working with the 50 megapixel 5DSR and all my unstabilized lenses are very, very difficult to hand hold. Even the 24 to 70 from Canon is very sharp, but if I shoot it at one 200th of a second at 70 millimeters, I, I get maybe one out of three pictures that have visible camera shake. And that's, so that's drastically breaking the reciprocal rule. It's very hard to get unstabilized lenses to be nice and sharp. So whenever you can, like if you have the old 24 to 70 without stabilization, upgrade to this VR model. I know DxO Mark says this one's not quite as sharp, but it's close. But I promise that VR is going to make a bigger difference overall to your shooting on a day-to-day -day basis. Whenever you can, use a tripod. For landscapes and stuff, carry a small tripod like the Manfrotto Be Free that I like because that extra stabilization is going to help. Uh, I would also suggest putting it on a delayed shutter and using the electronic shutter whenever you can. I'll discuss that a little bit. Little things like shutter shake or 
you pushing the shutter button here are going to reduce the sharpness because this camera captures so much detail that all those little techniques things start to show up. I would also suggest using the sharpest glass whenever you can. Things like, I like the Nikon 24 to 120. It's a good versatile lens, but it's not that sharp. And if you switch from, I don't know, a D750 to this 45 megapixel camera and you're using that lens, you won't really notice that much difference. And you will, but you will be paying the penalty of dealing with those bigger file sizes. So pay this, the money to get the D850, pay the money to get the sharp glass too. Let's talk about the process of taking a picture using live view. There's this, let's look at this switch here that lets you switch between stills and video. I go into stills mode and then I'll hit the LV button to get the back screen up. And so now I can see everything the camera sees. And you can kind of see the rest of our studio here and the control center there. Focusing and shooting is pretty much just like it would normally be. You can use the thumbstick here to move the focusing point around, push the shutter halfway to focus, and then push the shutter all the way to take a picture. However, you have a lot more options here. You can hit the info button to iterate between what's displayed on the screen. You can see here it's showing me a level. I love that level, especially for landscape photography, but really for all types of photography. I know what you're thinking. You want to see a histogram. Let's go in and turn on the histogram because it's not enabled by default. So notice as I'm flipping through here, I don't see a histogram. That's because on this camera, exposure preview is not currently enabled. If you want to see the histogram, you have to turn on exposure preview and you do that by pushing the OK button. OK. So now that I turn that on, you can kind of see the exposure slider is over on the right here. And now as I push the info button to iterate through, now I'll get to see that histogram, which lets me really check my exposure. This camera has a touch screen. It's kind of the first of its kind like that. And it gives you the, a couple of options for either touching to focus or touching to actually take a picture. So I'll touch the screen here and it will focus and take a picture. If I want it to just touch the fo to focus, I can push that there. And now you see it says touch AF on. So now when I touch it, it will focus, but not take a picture. And if I push it again, it will turn touch off completely. The only part of the screen that works with touch now is going to be that little indicator. Notice that the focusing in live view is not nearly as good as the focusing with the viewfinder. Just be prepared for that. They use completely different focusing systems. It's having like, it's like having two different cameras crammed into the same body when you have to switch between those. Also new to this camera is an electronic shutter. When you hear me take a picture in live view like that, that's, the physical shutter, like a curtain that comes down, blocks light momentarily, and then reveals the sensor to all the light and then comes back and blocks it. The mechan mechanical shutter eliminates what we call rolling shutter. Rolling shutter can make fast moving subjects that are straight appear tilty like this. So if you were to take a picture at the side of a moving car, the telephone poles and stuff might appear to be leaning. If you're using an electronic shutter, if you use the mechanical shutter, they'd be straight up and down. Now the mechanical shutter has a couple of disadvantages. It makes noise it will wear out over time. And it also shakes the camera a tiny bit, thus reducing your sharpness by a very, 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 very tiny amount. So you might want to at times use the electronic shutter. However, because of that rolling shutter effect, which is particularly pronounced in this camera, I would encourage you to use the mechanical shutter whenever you can. If you want to turn on the electronic shutter, it's pretty easy. You'll hit the I button here. You'll scroll down to this option here, electronic front curtain shutter, select that, and then you can turn it on. And now it'll sound a little bit different, but for the most part, it's gonna sound the same, but now it's using the more stable electronic front curtain shutter. A related option that also uses the electronic shutter is silent shooting. So you heard it was making sound. I can make it be completely silent, which is nice for like shooting a wedding or if you're a member of the press, maybe you're shooting some sort of event where you want to be as discreet as possible, maybe street photography. So again, I'll hit that I button while I'm in live view and I'll just scroll down to silent live view photography and I'll go up here to mode one. And I've selected that. And so now when I take a picture, did you hear it? No, because it's silent. There is an option on silent shooting that you can configure. I'm going to hit the menu button. I'll go to the camera, page four, and go to silent live shooting here. You can see the little question mark down here is generally good to know about. The question mark will tell you what the different modes mean. But for the most part, I just use mode one and there's nothing else to worry about. This is exactly like setting it from the live view screen by pushing the I button. It's just a different way to get to it. To use the focus peaking, put the camera into manual focus mode. The easiest way to do that is to use the dial on the body here. The lens will have a selector too, but it's always in the same place on the body. So just get in the habit of using that. And now in live view mode, I will hit the I button. 
and I'll go down to the second page and I'll pick the peaking level here and by default it's off. But for, to make it easy to see, I'll pick the highest sensitivity. You can pick from three different sensitivity levels. So if you pick the highest sensitivity and there's just red lines everywhere, then pick a lower sensitivity until you're satisfied with it. But as you see on the screen here, like look at those letters on the monitor and you can see that as I move the camera in and out and each letter comes in focus, the camera's highlighting them in red. So that doesn't mean that everything that's highlighted is perfectly in focus. It's highlighting a range of contrast. In general, in the middle of those high red highlights is gonna be where your focal plane is. So it's useful for getting a rough idea, but it's not that precise. If you wanna get really precise with it, I would use the magnification buttons here and zoom in just all the way. And that's gonna be a much more reliable way to get yourself in focus. If you wanna change the color of focus peaking, it's red by default, but if you're trying to focus on a red dress, that's not gonna be much help. You can change the color by going to the menu, going to the pencil icon here, going to D, and then D8, focus peaking highlight color. So select that and you can see you can select from a variety of different colors here, blue, red, yellow, white. Let's talk about file naming a little bit. As you're shooting, the camera's gonna be saving files onto a memory card and by default, all these files will be named DSC underscore some big number. That's fine. If you only have one camera, that's fine, but I know a lot of you will have a backup body, and if you have another Nikon backup body, a lot of those files are gonna be the same name, and that creates weird and confusing conflicts when you have two files with the same name that you're importing into your computer. So I suggest giving each camera that you use a unique prefix, that way when you import the pictures, you'll know it's your D750 or D850 or whatever. To change the file naming, hit the menu button here, go to the camera icon, and we'll go up to page one, file naming. And you can see right now, the prefix is set to DSC. So I'm gonna scroll in here and maybe I'll call it D85. Eh, that's precise enough, right? But it does help with the organization for managing multiple cameras. Let's talk about how to review your pictures. You've taken some pictures, it's a good idea to chimp it. So hit the play button here in the upper left corner and we can kind of scroll through our pictures. Look at that, we have a touch screen. So useful, right? The touch screen also allows you to quickly zoom in, so this can allow you to just double check that you nailed critical focus. You might wanna zoom in and look at everybody's eyes and then pan around to make sure you nailed it. You can then flip through using these buttons down here. I get in the habit of using the touch screen for this stuff. You don't have to. You can use this to like, very slowly kind of pan around, but this is so much faster than this. This works too, but if you wanna view other information about the picture, hit the up button and it will cycle through everything unless you haven't changed the default, in which case it will only show you this. So let's go in and change the information that we can see so that we can view that histogram when we're viewing a picture. To do that, hit the menu button. To change that, hit the menu button. Go to the playback menu up here and then playback display options. I'll select that. And then on the second page, overview. This is the one you want. That's really the most useful one. So then you need to hit okay to save it. And now when I review a picture, I can push up on the directional pad here and it will show me the histogram and all this other information, or I can push it again to see the image full screen. Another useful thing you can do that's kind of new on this camera is to rate your pictures. To rate a picture, I can hold down FN2 here while we're reviewing an image and then move the directional pad over to the right to give it, hmm, three, four, five stars. Now, if you import your pictures into Lightroom or Capture One, it will have that rating. And that's so useful because sometimes you'll be in a portrait session and you'll have shot 200 pictures, but as you're flipping through, you'll notice that one is just clearly better than the others. You don't wanna to have to dig through all 200 pictures at your computer. Give it a four star rating. When you get back down to the computer, you can sort your images, find it immediately. Let's talk about recording video. This is a great video camera. I've been shooting a lot with it. To record video, hit this little switch and go into video mode. You might have to hit the live view button to get the screen to come up. And then recording is as easy as pushing the record button up here and it will start recording. Now, this is a touch screen, so you can touch the screen, it will focus on stuff and it will respect whatever mode you're in. So right now I'm in program mode, which means the camera is controlling all the settings, but I could switch it into manual mode or aperture priority mode. You can change the quality of the image by hitting the I button here. And then the second option here is the frame size and frame rate, and that's gonna control your quality. So 
we, we're 4K. We like 4K, obviously. So I'm going to shoot 3840 by 2160 at 30p. So I'll select that. And now I will actually be recording in 4K. You can also choose to record in FX mode, which is full width, or DX mode, which has a 1.5 times crop. So let's zoom in all the way on this lens and look at our little workstation over here. So you can see how much of the frame is filled with the workstation. What if I wanted to film closer, but I didn't have more of a zoom lens? I could hit the I button, go to the first option, choose image area, and then select DX. And bam, everything gets 50% closer. Go back to FX. You can independently set the crop on stills and video. So you could have the video be set to DX and stills be set to FX. That's something to keep in mind. It doesn't, it remembers them separately. So if you're a hybrid shooter, if you're switching from stills to video, you might switch to video and then suddenly find a weird crop. Just remember that that's what that is. You can also control your audio levels in case you're running a mic in and maybe something is peaking. To control your audio levels, you'll be in video mode. You'll hit the I button and then you'll scroll down to microphone sensitivity. It's an audio, it's an auto right now and auto is garbage. So you'd want to get in here and then manually adjust the levels until you see them, you know, this is too loud. You can see some red is peaking there. So that's too loud. I want to dial this back and then this looks good. So I'll click okay. The reason I say that auto is garbage, it's, it's not, it's probably okay as a default, but especially if you're running a microphone, it's going to crank up the audio in moments of silence. So somebody will talk and then you'll hear and then they'll talk again and the background noise will drop down because it, when the talking stops, it'll try to amplify the background noise and it gets really unpleasant. Our favorite mics at this moment are the Sony wireless lav mics. They are super expensive, but they've been completely reliable and they allow you to run two different microphones into a single receiver, which helps when we shoot with two people. You can pick them up at sdp.io slash Sony lav. I'm going to talk to you about how to shoot in different modes. Hit the mode button up here. You can use your main dial on the back of the camera to switch between the different modes. Program mode is the default. That means that the camera chooses the aperture and the shutter speed. S is for shutter priority. That means you select the shutter speed and the camera selects the aperture. A is for aperture priority where you control the aperture, the iris, the opening in the lens, and the camera controls the shutter speed. And manual mode allows you to control both the aperture and shutter speed. On Nikon cameras, the back dial always controls the shutter speed and the front dial here always controls the aperture. So that's kind of nice because if I'm in aperture priority mode, I don't have to remember which dial to turn. If you want to know everything about aperture and f-stops, I have a free video at sdp.io slash f-stop. If you want to know everything about shutter and shutter priority and which shutter setting to choose for different situations, visit sdp.io slash shutter. And if you want to know how to use manual mode where you select both your aperture and shutter speed, go to sdp.io slash go manual. Going back to aperture priority, this camera has a built-in depth of field preview that will allow you to determine how much depth of field you're going to get at different f-stops. The easiest way to do that is to go into live view mode and then push the depth of field button. Now, a warning, if you push it while you're in uh, while you have the aperture set wide open, it's at f2.8, this is an f2.8 lens, so it's wide open you won't see anything. So let's set this aperture to f22. And then when I hit the depth of field preview, you can hear the shutter shut down and you can see it's switching between having the depth of field preview on and turning it off. So in live view mode, this button by default is a depth of field preview button. It's marked with a PV. Pushing that switches and it's persistent. So you can push it and you can see that that monitor in the foreground snaps into focus at f22 or blurs out when the lens is shooting wide open. Of course, if I took the picture, it would be representative of what I see when it, the aperture is shut down to f22. You can also use the depth of field preview button, same button, if you have the viewfinder up. The difference being that when you use depth of field preview with the viewfinder, the viewfinder is going to get darker because it's shutting down the aperture. So it will simulate the depth of field that you'll see, but the aperture shutting down is letting in less light. So you might not be able to see anything because it's dark. So I recommend using that depth of field preview during live view mode, just because the camera will amplify the light and keep the exposure constant for you. Let's go back to talking about video a little bit and we'll talk about the different modes because this camera, well, right now I'm in aperture priority mode. If I switch over to 
video, you can see I'm still in aperture priority mode, but it does behave a little bit differently. If you're a hybrid shooter and you're shooting between shooting stills and video, the camera does remember which mode you're in. So if you're in manual mode, it will still be in manual mode. However, it does not remember your settings between the different modes. So if you're shooting at f2.8 and you switch to video mode, it might switch to f6.3 if that's what you used last in video mode. Just keep in mind as you switch between stills and video, you have to go back and synchronize your settings every time. There's also a bulb slash time mode on this camera that will allow you to take exposures longer than 30 seconds. For example, if you wanted to shoot a picture of the stars or star trails, you might do a five minute exposure. But in manual mode, this camera won't let you shoot past 30 seconds. So to show you how to do this, let's get this camera into manual mode. And then I'll use the back dial to scroll left all the way to 30 seconds. And then if I go one more tick, it's bulb mode. Bulb mode is pretty useless. But if you have a remote shutter trigger and you already know how to use bulb mode, go for it. That's how you would access it. A more useful mode is time mode. Manual mode only allows you to do 30 second long exposures, which might not be enough for stars in really dark areas or say rural nighttime photography. You might wanna shoot at one minute or two minutes. There's two ways you can do that. You can use either bulb mode or time mode. To select these modes, you'll put the camera in manual mode and I'll hit the, I'll hit the info button here to bring up this display just to make it easier to see. Now that I'm in manual mode, the main dial at the back here controls the shutter speed. So I'll scroll all the way to the left. I'll get to 30 seconds and then I'll go a click past. And now I'm in bulb mode. Bulb mode allows you to uh, keep the shutter open by holding down the shutter, either by physically holding your finger here, which would be boring, or more likely by using an external shutter trigger. But a vastly superior mode is time mode. So in time mode, I can push the shutter once to lock the shutter open and it will stay open until I walk back to the camera and push it again to stop it. So if you wanted to do a two minute exposure, you would set time mode, push the shutter button open, and then set a stopwatch for yourself for two minutes. And then after two minutes had passed, you could go back and just push that shutter again to close it and complete your exposure. Lots more tutorial left, but I want to take a minute to plug my stuff. That's how we pay for all this. That's what's paying for my sore throat, guys. My book, Stunning Digital Photography, is the number one photography book in the world. You will learn how to, how to use your camera from this video, but this will teach you the art of photography. Lighting and composition and planning, emotion, mood, storytelling, all those things that will really give you good pictures. I promise, with that $10 book and a D3300, you would get better pictures than using a D850 and not knowing that artistic side of it. So take the time and go through this. It's not just a book, it's a video book with over 14 hours of video, a series of optional quizzes that you can take to make sure that you understand everything, and a Facebook group where you can share your pictures and get feedback from over 30,000 other learners in the same place as you. I also have books on Adobe Lightroom for post-processing software, Adobe Photoshop, and a book called My Photography Buying Guide, which tells you all about all these different cameras and lenses and what you can upgrade and what, what exactly focus breathing means, and whether or not you really need a lens with image stabilization or maybe you should consider a camera with sensor stabilization. All that stuff is covered in these books. The eBooks are 10 bucks each. The paperback books are a little bit more. You can just go to Amazon, search for my name, Tony Northrup, and check out the reviews. You can also buy it directly from our store at sdp.io slash store. We ship worldwide. Let's talk about the ISO. The ISO is the sensor's sensitivity to light in sort of a virtual way. If you don't know about ISO, take a moment, go to stp.io slash ISO, and you will learn way more than you ever wanted to know about ISO, including why I'm not saying ISO. That's deliberate. Now that you know all about ISO, I'll show you how to change it. It's easy. There's a big button labeled ISO. So let's pull this display up. I'll hold the ISO button down. And then with my thumb on the back here, I can set the ISO manually to whatever I want going up quite high. If I want the camera to take care of that, which me personally, I almost always use auto ISO, then I'll move the front dial here. So hold that down and just push that front dial. And now you can see it says ISO auto. That's where I almost always leave it. Auto ISO works really well on this camera. You have a couple of options if you do like auto ISO for extending it some. The first is in the menu system, 
Under the camera, under page two, we have ISO sensitivity settings, so I'll select that. Now I can set the maximum sensitivity, which I usually like to set that to the maximum, which is high two. There's no reason not to do that. You know, I don't like to have to shoot at whatever ISO 500,000 or whatever that corresponds to. But if it's dark and I have no choice, then I'd rather do that and get the picture than not get the picture. So I pretty much always turn that on. And if you shoot video, you can control the ISO. It has a separate setting. There's the video camera option. The last option on page one is ISO sensitivity settings. So we can set this to, oh, set the maximum sensitivity here to high two. And you can also control whether ISO auto control is on in manual mode. You probably know better than I do whether you want that. Exposure compensation is incredibly important if you're using any sort of auto exposure, including auto ISO. If you say you're in, let's say I'm in live view and I'm looking at the histogram and I see, oh, you know, I want this screen to be completely white and it's not, it's a little, it's a little gray. The histogram isn't touching the right side of the screen. I keep firing the camera. I want to add exposure compensation. By default, you'll do that by pushing the plus or minus button here, hold this down, and then move the back dial to make the picture brighter or darker. And in live view, you can see those changes in real time, if it's too bright, if it's too dark. This camera has a great metering system, so even complex backlit situations, I find that it tends to nail it. But there are always gonna be times when you have to adjust the exposure compensation. That's how you do it. You won't see those changes reflected immediately if you're using the viewfinder, only if you're using live view. So if you're using the viewfinder, be sure you take your picture and then you hit the play button and you review it to make sure that you nailed the exposure. There is an option for easy exposure compensation and something that will automatically reset your exposure compensation, which a feature that I absolutely love. Turn that on by hitting the menu button. We're gonna go down to the pencil icon here, easy exposure compensation. I'll touch that and turn on on auto reset. Now in aperture priority mode, the front dial here is changing the aperture. And now that I've turned on easy exposure compensation, I can dial in exposure compensation using the back dial. So you can see the amount of exposure compensation is reflected here on this dial right below the settings. So darker pictures, brighter pictures. I can go into live view and you'll see it too. Dial this up and they get brighter. Dial it left, it gets darker. The only difference between regular exposure compensation and easy exposure compensation is I don't have to push this plus minus button here. But if you're a Canon user, Canon doesn't have that plus minus button. You probably prefer the easy exposure compensation. It's also nice that it resets automatically because I don't know how many times I've dialed in plus two exposure compensation for something and then picked my camera up 24 hours later and forgotten it and just overexposed a whole set. If you're concerned about nailing exposure, you can use bracketing to have the camera automatically create three or more pictures at different exposures. One picture that's properly exposed, one that's underexposed, and one that's overexposed. There's actually a button dedicated to bracketing right here on the front of the camera. You can see BKT. So I'm going to hold that button down. Most of the stuff I'm showing on the back screen you can see on the LCD screen on top. It's just easier to film the back screen. So I'll hit BKT and now I can use the front and back dials to change how many frames and what the difference in exposure is. So you can see here, zero frames means there's no bracketing. If I click it to the right, I can do three frames, five frames, or seven frames, or even nine frames. So most of the time, three frames is plenty. This camera has lots of dynamic range anyway. And then the second number here is controlled by the front dial, and that controls the difference in exposure. One stop of exposure isn't that much, especially if you're shooting raw. I will often shoot three frames at plus or minus two stops or even plus or minus three stops. That's my most common bracketing setting. If I'm shooting a landscape and I'm shooting into the sun and there's lots of shadow, I might go all the way to five frames at plus or minus two stops of exposure. Now, when you're done, be sure you go back in and dial that down to zero frames of bracketing just to make sure it goes away. If you do shoot bracketed sequences and you wanna pull the most dynamic range out of it, I only know one app that will do this and that's Adobe Lightroom. It will take your raw files and combine them into one like ultra raw file that has all the shadow and highlight information from those back bracketed sequences. There are lots of different HDR apps out there but Adobe Lightroom allows you to work in the raw file to create very realistic and perfectly clean images where even the shadows have no noise at all. 
Uh, if you don't have Adobe Lightroom, you can pick it up at sdp.io slash Adobe Deal. Now let's talk about the different shutter modes. By default, when you get the camera, it will take one picture for you. And that's because it comes in single shot mode. There's a physical dial over here on the left that controls the shutter modes. So the S there is single shot. To change it, you're going to push this button in here. You're going to hold that down, and then you're going to twist this dial. CL is continuous low, a little slow. CH is continuous high, quite a bit faster. And then you have some other modes for Q is quiet, but single, one shot. Remember, you also have silent mode if you use live view. QC is quiet and continuous. And then you have a delayed shutter, which allows you to set a timer. So you push that, and then you can see the red light there blinks for a little bit, and it takes a picture. That delayed shutter is for times when you want to set the camera on a tripod, but be in the picture, so you like run around the camera and put your arm around your family. I'll show you quickly how to change how long that timer is set for. I'll hit the menu button, go into the pencil, go to timers, AE lock, and then you can see self timer, set that, and I can scroll in here. 10 seconds is good for running around the camera and putting your arm around your family. Two seconds is good for, say, astrophotography, macro photography, where the purpose of the shutter timer is to eliminate any camera shake. You can also choose a number of shots. So rather than just taking one shot, you could have it take up to nine shots. If I'm doing a self-portrait with my family, I would definitely set that to nine shots because just because at some point somebody's going to be blinking and that's not a frame you'd want to use. If you take nine shots, it doesn't cost you anything and odds are one of them is going to be better than the others. You can also control how long you wait between shots. By default, it's set to half a second. But for something like self-portraits, two or three seconds would be a little more useful. The last option here is something you don't really need anymore, but it's mirror up, mup. And uh, mirror up just moves the mirror out of the way, thus reducing the shutter shock a little bit. The reason you don't need it anymore is every time you use live view, the mirror moves out of the way anyway. So rather than ever using mirror lock up, just go into live view. It accomplishes the same thing and allows you to see what you're doing. I talked about CL mode, continuous low speed mode. I'm fine with the rate that it's at, but if you want to slow it down even further, you can go into the menus, go down to the pencil icon, D, and then D1 is CL shooting mode speed. So you could slow it down to one frame a second or two frames a second. I'm not going to change it, but that's where it is. Let's talk about the camera's different focusing modes. This camera has a great focusing system borrowed from the D5 and the D500, and you'll use this button here to control it. So you'll be holding that button in and then I'm holding that button in, and now I can use the front and back dials to choose the focus mode and the AF area mode. For the focus mode, you can choose between AFS, which focuses and then stops focusing once it locks in focus. It's good for still subjects, or AFC, which tracks moving subjects. I use AFC all the time because on this particular camera, AFC is very good. So even if you're taking a picture of a still subject, you can AFC on it, and be pretty confident that it'll lock in. Nonetheless, I'll always take a couple of shots. Sometimes there'll be a little variation in focus, and you might find that one of them is a tiny bit sharper than the other. The front dial controls your AF focusing mode, switching between, say, all 153 focusing points, just 72 points, 25 points, 9 points, or a single autofocus point. This is using all autofocus points here. Those are all pretty obvious, and if you're not sure what they do, Hold your eye up to the viewfinder and you can see it showing you the difference between the different focusing modes. I only ever use the single auto point mode or basically all autofocus points. I use the single autofocus mode, single autofocus point pretty much all the time unless I'm shooting flying birds against a clear sky and then I find it easier to track them with all autofocus points turned on. Though there's one mode worth mentioning here, and that is 3D mode. 3D mode uses the camera's metering system. The metering system can see color. So it could pick out a player that's wearing a red jersey and track it as it moves side to side in your viewfinder. And it can be really cool. It can be really useful for sports and stuff. So if you're keeping up with a moving subject that might want to move around the frame, 3D mode is the right choice. If you're coming from a D5 or a D500, 
My unofficial tests have found that 3D focusing does not track as well on a D850 as it does on those other cameras. And Nikon says it has the same focusing system, but other people have found the same thing. So I just wanted to warn you ahead of time. It works, but I found that it will regularly jump between different players at a sporting event, or it might switch from a bird to focusing on the background. It can kind of be a problem. To manually focus, you can either select manual focus on the lens or on the body, but I suggest you always use the body. You can see there's an AF and M mode here. The reason I would suggest using the switch on the body is it's always in the same place. If you switch lenses, you'll have to remember where that switch is, so just get in the habit of using it on the body there. In live view, manual focus is quite a bit easier because you have the option of using focus peaking and magnification by hitting the plus button here to really make sure that you nail it. If you didn't see the bit on focus peaking, I covered it earlier in the video. This camera has an awesome metering system. You can choose from different metering modes, but I never ever change it. The default metering mode is great. If you're an old school guy and you know all about the different metering modes, I'll just show you where the button is. Here's the button. It's on the, the dial here on the left. You'll hold that down, and now you can switch between the different metering modes. I'll hold this down, and now I can switch between the matrix metering, which is the best, spot metering that's linked. This, that has a little asterisk, means it's linked to the focusing point. Spot metering in the center, center weighted metering, and again, back to the matrix metering. I just leave it on the matrix metering, and then if it blows it, I use exposure compensation to adjust for that. I'll also show you how to control the flash and flash exposure compensation. Now, there is no built-in flash on this camera, but you could, of course, plug in a flash onto the hot shoe here. If you want to control the flash exposure compensation, use the lightning bolt symbol here. Hold this button down, and now you can see you can change the flash mode between like sh slow shutter sync or red eye reduction, or you can change the flash compensation with the front dial. My, if I'm using a flash, I almost always dial the flash compensation into like negative 1.3 stops, just because I find too much flash is upsetting. Not enough flash, it's okay, I can always raise it up, but too much flash can blow up people's face and stuff, so I just dial it down as my own personal default. The auto white balance on this camera works great, and I almost always shoot raw, and even if I'm shooting JPEG, it's easy to fix in post. So my personal preference is to fix white balance in post. If you want to change the white balance in, while you're shooting, hold down the WB button here, and then use the front and back dials to choose your different uh, white balance modes. It's pretty simple. It shows a picture of the sort of light that you might be in. Fluorescent, incandescent, sunlight. Uh, again, auto works just fine. If you want to dial in a specific Kelvin, you can do it with the Kelvin setting here. You can also create white balance presets if you're regularly switching between different white balances. I'm going to show you how to format a memory card. I like to use big memory cards and not format my images every time just because that memory card becomes a backup for me. But if you have unloaded your pictures from your camera to your computer and then backed those pictures up off-site in another location, then you can format your memory card and feel pretty safe about it. I'll hit the menu button here. It's under the wrench icon. The very first option is format memory card. Just pick the slot that you want to format and then you'll have to hit the select yes and then hit OK here. It will erase all of your pictures. If you accidentally format your memory card, visit the shortcut stp.io slash photo rec, P-H-O-T-O-R-E-C. There's a free tool that will allow you to recover them. Back button focus. This camera actually has two buttons you can use for back button focus. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, visit sdp.io slash ybb. I have a free video that will explain it to you. For all of you who love back button focus, I'll show you how to turn it on now. Hit the menu button here. I couldn't live without it. We're going to go to the pencil icon, and then we're going to go to autofocus A, and then A8, AF activation. You can see by default it's shutter and AF on, which means either pushing the shutter button halfway or pushing the AF on button will cause it to autofocus. I want to choose AF on only, and then enable for the autofocus release. Now this decouples focusing from the shutter button here. So now when I push the shutter button halfway, it's not focusing. It only focuses when I hit the AF on button here. That's a start. And that's, that's all you need to do to enable back button focus is turn it off. So now you can pick the camera up and push the AF on button and you'll see that it will instantly focus for you. And then you only use the shutter button to take pictures, really. Push it all the way to take pictures. One nice thing about this camera is you can use the thumbstick here. You can push the thumbstick and activate a different focusing mode. 
Therefore, I, the way I do it is I use this to focus for a single autofocus point, or if there's a flying bird that goes past and I want to use all the autofocus points to make it easier to track, I'll use this button. Here's how I set that up. I'll hit the menu button here, I'll go to the pencil, and then controls, I missed it, controls, and then F1, custom control assignment, I'll select that. I'm gonna go down to this lower thumbstick icon here. This indicates what happens when you push it. See it says sub-selector center. So I'll push that, and now I'll scroll up to the first page here, and I'm gonna select AF area mode plus AF on. So I'll select this, and now I'm going to select dynamic area AF, 153 points. So now that I select that, this AF on button will focus in my current mode, which is usually single autofocus points. I select AF area mode plus AF on, and then I'm gonna scroll down to the last option, which is auto area AF. I'll select this, and now I can use AF on to use a single autofocus point where I can push the thumbstick in to focus anywhere. So if I'm ever having a hard time grabbing focus and I just wanna quickly get anything in focus, I just remember move my thumb over to the thumbstick and grab it. Practice that ahead of time. Get your thumb coordinated so it's kind of automatically switching between those two because you want to be ready when that like flock of beautiful eagles flies out over the sea or something and in front of the setting sun. You just want to be ready. Let's talk about how to use the interval timer. The interval timer will allow you to take pictures on a regular basic. The D850 has a new and cool feature called focus shift and if you've ever done focus stacking, it'll basically automate the in-camera part of that process for you. Focus stacking is a process where you buy if there's a scene that has too much depth in it to, for you to get the, the foreground and the background and focus all at the same time, you'll take a picture focusing on the foreground, the middle ground, and the background, and then later on your computer, you can stack them together. That's focus stacking. It's often used for landscape photography or macro photography. In fact, I cover it in chapter 12 of stunning digital photography here for the sake of macro photography. And this can automate that process for you so you're not manually moving the focusing ring and focusing in different parts of the frame. To use focus shift, hit the menu button here. We're gonna to go to the camera icon, down to page four, and then you'll see the next to last option is focus shift shooting. So I'll select that. And here you can select the number of shots and the steps between it and the interval between the shots and whether you wanna use exposure smoothing or silent photography. I normally would use silent photography just to eliminate any of the shutter shake. I assume it's a still scene if you're doing focus shift, so I would turn that on. I can't tell you how many shots you should take or what the focus step should be. You'll pretty much just have to experiment with it because it's very specific to the scene that you're using, how close you are, how much depth there is. 100 shots is gonna be a lot to process. It doesn't hurt to have too many. You could always go back and shoot 100 and only use five of them or 10 of them but normally I wouldn't shoot more than like 10 or 20. But if you're getting into extreme macro, you might be shooting 100. You can also make it a little more easy to organize by changing the starting storage folder and creating a, a new folder. Thus, when you look at the memory card, you'll see there'll actually be a separate subfolder in there for your focus shifted pictures. Time lapses work in a very similar way. Time lapses take pictures on a regular interval. Maybe you take a picture every one minute. You could then stitch those pictures together into one massive, gorgeous, highly detailed 8K video, you know, showing the sun setting over the period of a couple of hours. To use time lapses, oh, they work great on this camera, the best time lapse camera ever. I'll hit the menu button, I'll go to the camera icon here, and then on the last page, page four, you'll see interval timer shooting. I'll select that, and now you'll configure it. You'll configure how, how long you want to go between shots. I can't tell you what that should be, it depends on how long you wanna be shooting over and how many frames you need for your video. If you're filming at 30 frames a second, if you're publishing at 30 frames a second, you will need 30 pictures for every one second of video. And I usually target uh, 10 to 15 seconds of video, which means I need 300 to 450 shots. So usually it'll be, I'll, I'll take the amount of time that I'm filming, maybe it's two hours, and I'll divide that by 450 or to be safe, I'll divide it by 600 and figure out what my interval thus needs to be. There can be a little bit of math involved, so you might have to bust out a calculator. Um, interval times shots over interval is the number of shots it'll take at each interval, and I almost always just take one shot for that. I always turn on exposure smoothing. I found out that that works fantastic, and I'll also turn on silent photography. Not only does that not wake you up if you're taking a, a time lapse in the early morning hours from your hotel room, it'll let you sleep instead of having hearing click, 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 
but silent photography does not wear out the shutter because it's not moving the mechanical shutter. So yay for the silent photography. I've had no problem with it at all. Interval priority here. In interval priority, and let's say your interval is 10 seconds and it gets dark and the camera decides it needs a 30 second exposure, interval priority will interrupt that 20 second, that 30 second exposure in order to start the next exposure. So normally I would turn that off, but normally I'm also making sure that the exposure time would never exceed the interval either. And again, just like with focus stacking, you have the option here for uh, the storage folder. So you can make a new storage folder for every time lapse, which just makes it easier to organize all those files. When you're ready, you'll go up and you'll just select start and that will actually launch the time lapse for you. Those are 8K time lapses. Those are creating still images that you would then have to pull onto your computer and run into Adobe Premiere or LR time lapse or some other tool to turn them into a video. This camera can create time lapses in camera, what they call 4K time lapses. So to do the 4K time lapses, it's a type of video. So you'll switch it into video mode here, hit the menu button, go down to the video menus here, and then we'll scroll down to time-lapse movie, the very last option. You'll probably recognize all of these settings. When you have it set, you can click start. It's scaling those files down to the standard 3840 by 2160 resolution. So the file size is gonna be much smaller. You're gonna have a video that's ready to share. So that's, the, the quality is lower, but you can drop it right into your vlog or whatever you're doing and not have to do any extra post-processing. I'm also gonna suggest that you set the copyright information on the camera to your own name. This makes it a little bit easier to organize your files, and I guess I always hold out some hope that if I lose my camera, somebody will think to look at the copyright information and then contact me. Pull up the menus, go to the wrench icon, go to page two, and then you'll see copyright information down here. Here you can set the artist name to your own name, or you can set it to Tony Northrup because if you lose your camera, maybe they'll call me and I get a free camera. Put whatever you want in there. Tony North is like, it's close enough. Snapbridge is Nikon's wireless system. It allows you to connect the camera via Bluetooth to your smartphone. I have worked with many people who use Snapbridge and we have all had different experiences with it. Some people say it works okay, but almost everybody has some stories of Snapbridge failing when they really needed it. Snapbridge is different from other wireless systems, even wireless systems in earlier Nikon cameras. It uses both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi together. Bluetooth is used to maintain ongoing communications between your camera and your smartphone. Pretty much all the time, your camera will be talking to your smartphone just like it might talk to your car when you're in your car in order to play music from your phone to your car. It uses this Bluetooth to set up a Wi-Fi connection. So it does have Wi-Fi, but you wouldn't turn on Wi-Fi from the camera. You would turn on Wi-Fi from your smartphone. So use your smartphone to tell the camera to turn on Wi-Fi, and then from your smartphone you would connect to that Wi-Fi network, and then you would be able to exchange pictures. The setup process for Snapbridge is kind of a pain. Go into the App Store on your phone, Android or iOS, and search for Snapbridge. Select it and install the app. You can see I already have it installed, so I'll open it up. So now from here you can see I haven't connected to a camera in the past. You can only pair one phone to one camera. So if you've connected to another camera, you're gonna to have to delete that connection, which involves removing it from here and then going into the Bluetooth settings on your phone and making it forget the Bluetooth connection too. So I'll hit plus here to connect to a camera. And now you can see it starts to look for a camera. Now I wanna go ahead and get into my camera here, hit the menu button. I'm gonna go down to the wrench icon the third page down, you'll see connect to smart device and I'll hit start. You don't do this every time you connect. You only do this on the initial setup and then you should never have to do it again unless you change your smartphone or camera or something. So now you can see it's telling me to go ahead and launch Snapbridge on my phone and I can see that my phone has already picked up the camera. So I'll select that and now it's connecting to the camera. This actually works better on Android phones than it does on the iPhone the iPhone has a couple of extra steps, which is why I'm demonstrating on an iPhone. On an Android phone, you might find that it skips a couple of steps. So now the phone is prompting me to select an accessory, and then you can see I had to wait like a good 20, 30 seconds. So it might say select an accessory and you'll see nothing. Just be patient, wait until it pops up, and then select it. Now it's showing you a Bluetooth pairing request. It's showing you an authorization code. They match up. So I'll hit the pair here, and then I'll select OK on my camera. And now it's establishing a connection. 
and it says my connection has been successfully established. So I'll click OK here. The camera is prompting me to download location data from the smart device. That means it can pull the GPS data from my smartphone and tag my pictures with it. That's a great option. So I will select yes. Sync clock with smart device. That's also great if you're changing time zones or daylight savings time or whatever. So I'll select yes. And it's done. The initial connection is set up. Do not try to go back into your camera to start it. Always start it from your phone here. So as I go back here, there are a few options you might want to turn on. Make sure the upload location is turned on and the synchronized clock is turned on. You did that from your camera. I just want to make sure that it's uh, working okay. Auto download should always be turned off. That might work okay on a 20 megapixel D500, but you do not want to use down auto download on a 45 megapixel camera. It will bog it down, especially if you're a pro and you're shooting a lot of pictures it will quickly become a nightmare. <laughs> so now I'll show you some of the cool things you can do. Let's hit the camera button here, and I get the options for remote photography or to download pictures. So I'll select download pictures, and it's prompting me to switch to Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi connection is faster than the Bluetooth connection. The Bluetooth connection sends pictures very, very slowly. So I'll select yes, and now it's, a it's establishing a connection to the camera. What it really means is it's telling the camera to turn on its wireless access point. Now, in Android, it will probably automatically connect to the camera's Wi-Fi for you. On the iPhone here, it's telling me that I have to go in and connect to the Wi-Fi network. Notice that it's telling me the password for the Wi-Fi network is Nikon D850. So I'll click go here and it will take me into the settings but into the wrong page of the settings. So it took me to SnapBridge settings, but I actually need to hit back and then go up here to Wi-Fi. And as it browses, okay, now my phone is detecting the D850 network. I'm gonna connect to that. Now it's connecting to that Wi-Fi network. It's gonna prompt me for a password. Remember what it was? Nikon D850, all caps. It seems like it might matter. I think I've connected to this one before. So it hasn't memorized, but I would normally be typing that out. So I'll switch back over to the SnapBridge app. It says Wi-Fi connection established, updating display. And now it's downloading all the thumbnails from the camera to here. It will not show you raw images. It will only show you JPEG pictures. So if you plan to use SnapBridge, you should be shooting raw plus JPEG or just JPEG, or you can even shoot JPEG to a particular card. You can see here, I click that and it allows me to pick different memory card slots. So if you're shooting JPEG to your SD card, you could go here and select slot two. I just took out my SD card, so I don't have any options there. I do see one video that I could transfer here. If you actually want to send a RAW file from your camera to your phone, it's not too late. What you can do is review your pictures and then hit the I button here, go down to retouch, select that, and then raw processing, NEF raw processing, select that, choose where you're going to save it. I'll save it to the XQD card slot and then select EXE to complete the conversion. What I did was I manually converted a raw file to a JPEG file so that now it could be transferred over to my phone here. I don't know why they don't set it up so that, here it is, this is the picture I just converted. I don't know why they don't set it up to do that automatically, but you can do it manually and now you know how. So now that I've selected this picture, I can click download and choose either to download a very small two megapixel file. Those suck. Even on Instagram, people will complain that it's blurry. So I'll download the original size image. This could take a second. It's a 45 megapixel picture. It's kind of a big file. Even over Wi-Fi, it takes a moment. Now that the download is done, I can go into the photos here and oh, there it is. It's the last one. So now it's just on my phone. I could put it on Instagram or whatever. The other option you can do is remote photography. So I'll select that. Again, it's going to establish the connection to the camera. It wants to connect to the Wi-Fi, so it's going to be the same process that we just did of, of manually going in and connecting to the Wi-Fi network, something that should be automatic on Android phones. Connect to the Wi-Fi. It's annoying that it's always like disconnecting from the Wi-Fi, and then you have to reconnect to it, but that's just kind of how it works. It's always It automatically shuts down the Wi-Fi network on the, the camera to say battery, but it means you have to keep going back through that process over and over again. So now remote photography, it's linked up, it's connected via Wi-Fi, and now you can see, I can see a real-time live view. That can be useful if you, I don't know, maybe you're in front of the camera and you wanna film yourself, you can't flip the screen forward, but you could use remote photography to take a selfie of yourself and then trigger it with that. You can hit the settings button here to choose between the download size and whether or not you're gonna use a self timer. Um, if you're gonna change any settings, you have to do it from the camera though. You, you just can't do it from the app.
if SnapBridge stops working for you, delete the camera and delete the Bluetooth connection and then go back through the process of adding it again. It is a little painful. And as I suggested at the beginning of the video, you might be happier just getting an SD card reader and attaching it to your phone. I wanna show you my menu because there are a lot of menu settings on this and you won't remember where they all are, but this next or this very last option here is my menu. Here you can add your favorite settings. Select that, pick which menu you wanna choose from. Maybe you change the playback folder a lot. I can't imagine why. And now I've added that playback folder option to my menu. That way, if there are 10 options that I go through regularly, I will put them all in my menu and I don't have to try to remember where exactly they're buried. If you don't wanna do that manually, what I would do instead is go to my menu, go to choose tab and select recent settings. Recent settings will just remember the most recent settings that you've worked with. So recent settings is built automatically. And if you don't take the time to build my menu, go to recent settings. It should be the default. I don't know why they don't do that. Let's go over some accessories for your D850. My favorite lenses and grips and stuff. The grip is awesome because it actually improves the camera. It takes it from a maximum of seven frames a second to nine frames a second. You will need to buy a separate vertical grip and then buy a separate battery for it and then also buy a separate charger. The chargers that Nikon sells are very expensive, so look for a third-party charger. I got mine for about 30 bucks. I'm gonna go over some of my favorite lenses. Nikon for the day-to-day -day shooting lens would probably rec rec recommend the 24 to 120, which is what I have here. It's a good lens, but for me personally, I much prefer the Sigma 24 to 105. I found it to be sharper and faster, and I actually like the stabilization. It's a bigger, heavier lens. It's about 850 bucks, so it's a little more expensive, but I really like it. Another good cheap lens for just popping on if you're just going to walk around and maybe. Um, get some nice bouquet is the 50 millimeter f1.8g. It's only 217 bucks and it's just a nice low light lens and it's good and sharp, especially for the price. It's just maybe the best value in the whole Nikon lineup. The fantastic plastic, they call it. If you get into portraits, my favorite lens for that is a 70 to 200 f2.8. I'm going to suggest a couple of different options. The Tamron 70 to 200 f2.8 is great. It's quite sharp, pretty well built. It's not as well built as the Nikon version, but it's okay and it's fairly inexpensive at 1500 bucks. They have an original and a G2 now. We have them both. The G2 feels better, but I kind of like the original one a little bit better. It doesn't have as much focus breathing, something you can look it up in my photography behind guide. If you have a few more bucks and you want a better quality lens, I really like the 70 200 F2.8e. That's the latest version. It has less focus breathing than the older G model. It has great image quality. It's versatile. It's good for sports and portraits. And if you stick a teleconverter on there, like 1.4 times, 1.7, 2.0, you can get more far away subjects. It's just basically my favorite lens in their whole lineup. If you get into landscapes or maybe street photography in places like Europe where the streets are really tight, it's really nice to have a super wide angle lens. The 16 to 35 F4 is awesome. This is it, 16-35 f4. Look, it's stabilized, so it's a great walking around lens. It's nice and light, and it's not that expensive at 1100 bucks. Great image quality out of it. If you want a little bit better image quality, sharper image quality, or maybe you want better low light work, like maybe you want something for astrophotography, the 14-24 to f2.8 is 1900 bucks. Look at that front element. It's huge. It's huge. It's an awesome lens. Uh, so I highly recommend it. You can pick all these up at our sdp.io links here. I also recommend the Rokinon 12 millimeter, which I forgot to bring out. It's a little prime lens, but it's a 12 millimeter f2.8. So it's great for astrophotography. And if you want to just dabble in astrophotography and you want to, don't want to drop two grand on a big zoom like that, the 12 millimeter f2.8 is kind of the best inexpensive option for that. But as long as you're into these wide fast primes, I would also check out the Rokinon 24 millimeter f1.4. These are manual focus lenses, but they actually work pretty well. They're pretty sharp. And again, for the money, they're a great value. If you're looking for a flash, I would not recommend the Nikon flashes. Instead, I would recommend Godox flashes. That's what we use. Not affiliated with them. I just like the Godox flashes. They have a separate battery pack. They're way less expensive and they can be remotely triggered. It just, you can spend way less money on it. For $200, I would pick up the V860N. Works just about like a Nikon flash. We use the Godox or Flashpoint strobes in our studio. Flashpoint is just the American brand for Godox, so buy either one. These strobes are really nice because they have a battery pack and the battery lasts multiple days. 
So that means there are no cords laying around your studio when you're working in studio, or you can just pick them up and take them on location. They're really easy to charge. They are reliable and very, very fast and very high quality. So check them out at sdp.io slash FPC. Get the Nikon transmitter for your camera. The strobes are interchangeable. They talk to any of the transmitters. If you're looking for a cheap tripod, I recommend this Dolica tripod for like 46 bucks. It's better than nothing, but if you have a good camera, you might as well get a good tripod. Our favorite travel tripod is the BeFree tripod from Manfrotto. Folds up really small, very light, especially if you get the carbon fiber model, and it's pretty stable. If you want a more serious tripod, a heavier tripod that can handle a little bit more wind, pick up this poorly named tripod from Manfrotto. We just like Manfrotto tripods at this link here. And finally, educate yourself. Buy our books that will make a bigger difference in your photography than anything else. And it's a good way to thank me for completely blowing my voice out in like almost two hours of continuous talking. Stunning Digital Photography is the number one photography book in the world with more than 14 hours of video built into it. And we have books on Lightroom with 14 hours of video a Photoshop book with 12 hours of video and a photography buying guide that has all the secrets that will save you thousands of dollars helping you pick the right gear the first time, helping you determine whether you should get gray market, whether you can buy used and how to make sure that you get used. And I can even show you how to sell your gear and maybe even turn it over for a profit if you're kind of savvy. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel for lots of free new videos. Hit the bell to be told when you upload a new video. And if you have any questions, write a comment. If you have tips for other D50 owners, things you figured out that I didn't mention, write a comment down below and uh, give me a like. Bye. Thanks.